بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما انفعنا وزلنا علما وعملا بفضلك يا رحمة الرحيمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بمعنى Zakhna khair for having me back here. It's great to be back in Dublin. It's great to be back here. Just in Ramadan, I think it was um, a few months ago or beginning of the year, it was here, alhamdulillah. So lovely to be back and a uh, different topic this time. Last time it was Surah Yusuf and this time it is Dua and Istikhara. And, and, and intentionally I wanted to cover both because Dua is great and, and we can talk a lot about Dua, but Istikhara is one of the most important types of Dua. Um, particularly for many of us in the kind of stage of life that we're in right now we're going to need a lot of dua, we're going to need to know how to make dua properly and we're going to know, need to know how to also perform istikhara and do istikhara properly because there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding it, there's a lot of complications sometimes it becomes over complicated when in reality it's a very simple thing to do um, and, and likewise with dua, it's you know for me the way I see it is it's like having a tool in front of you and you know you haven't read the instruction manual for it so you don't know how to use it and therefore you don't know how to extract the benefit from it and you don't know how to do it properly so it's like dua is in front of us we've all heard of dua we know what dua is but we haven't read the instruction manual which is like the quran and the sunnah and we don't know how to utilize it properly because as we know dua is as the prophet told us dua is the weapon of a believer um, but we don't know how to yield this weapon and use it properly, utilize it properly, right? So dua is actually extremely powerful um, and we're going to talk about different aspects of dua inshallah but also as we said istikhara as well, okay so let's get straight into it uh, we don't have much time so I don't think we're going to be able to go through every single slide in detail, some of them I'm just going to brush over um, but we're just starting here with what is dua, just some of the basics, right? What is dua? So dua in and of itself, as we know, we usually translate it as it's a supplication. It's a prayer, it's a supplication. Literally, dua in Arabic means to call out. Da'a means to call out, right? It means to, to make a call. So, of course, we know the connection is that when you make dua, you're calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like the, the word da'wa comes from the word dua as well. In, in Arabic, it's the same root. Da'wa also, literally, you could say it's an invitation. Right, a da'wah you know, to Islam, you're inviting someone to Islam. A da'wah, you can invite someone to your home to host them, right? And in order to invite someone, you need to call that person. You call them and then you invite them. So likewise, uh, dua is a call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Dua is a supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So that is literally what dua means and there's different definitions here. Um, for example, one of the scholars, he said that dua is asking Allah for anything that is of benefit to you and also asking him to repel and to remove anything which is harmful and this is a great summary of what dua is because when you're making dua this is usually what we do is we're asking Allah for anything that is good for us and you're asking Allah to remove anything which is harmful for us right that is really the the essence of dua whether it's asking for uh, good results or, or, or career or wealth or health and family and things you're asking Allah for something which is good obviously and ultimately you're asking Allah for something which uh, you know, allows you to stay away from any harm, anything bad, right? So this is ultimately what dua is. It is asking Allah for what is good, right? And all of us, we want what is good for us, but we don't always know what is good for us, right? And at the same time, we also want Allah to protect us from what is harmful, but also we don't know always what is harmful, what is bad for us, because sometimes that could also be good for us, right? So we have a, a different kind of perception of what is good and evil, or good and bad. Whereas for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's very different. So that's why dua is so important. But dua also, there's many ahadith relating to dua, how dua is so powerful that it actually has the, it has the power and the ability to even change the course of one's destiny. Right? And again, from our perspective, maybe sometimes we get confused on this. From Allah's perspective, nothing is changing. You know, sometimes we, we ask this question, how can destiny change when Allah has already written something for us? The thing is, Allah already knew if it was going to change from the beginning or not. Allah knew if there was going to be like a, a U-turn, or there was going to be an exit that you take, or you were going to go in this direction or that direction. Allah knew that. From our perspective, it's going to change because of the action that we take. Right? So the action can actually change the outcome Right? a lot of times. It's not just that we were born, we live our lives however, and you know we just 
we just hope for the best. No, we, we live our lives and we do what we can and then we trust that Allah SWT is going to bring a change and bring something good to us. And dua is one of the elements, one of the components that can bring, help bring about that change. Whether it's victory from Allah, help from Allah, whatever it may be. Like we gave the example earlier of the Battle of Badr. And again, actually Allah records this in Surah Al-Anfal when He tells the Prophet Wasallam. You know how we just heard that the Prophet was making dua constantly. Before the Battle of Badr, even though, um, you know, on one hand, victory was promised for, from Allah, but on the other hand, from the Sahaba point of view, from the companions point of view, as you know, that the Sahaba were around 300 in number, 313. The other side, they were a thousand in number, fully prepared, well equipped, right? So on paper, that looked like a certain defeat for the Muslims. It looked like the odds were completely stacked against the Muslims. This was almost a certain defeat. There's no way that they could overcome this army. But the Prophet made dua, as well as taking action, as well as preparing him and the, and the companions. So he made dua and, and, they, they, and they took action as well. So coupling these two together, then Allah says in the Quran, what does he say in Surah Al-Anfal? It says, Remember when you made dua to Allah. Remember when you called Allah for help. فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ And Allah responded to you, saying, أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ بِأَلْفٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُرْدِفِينَ That I am going to help and assist you with 1,000 angels that are going to come row after row, one after the other. So this is how Allah granted victory to the Muslims at Badr, is that Allah ended up sending 1,000 angels that they could not see. Allah sent 1,000 angels, one after the other, to help and assist them. So even though on paper in front of them it looked like we're outnumbered, there's 300 of us, but behind the scenes, Allah sent a thousand angels. So actually, they were more than the enemy at the time. So this is how Allah can help, this is how Allah can assist. Sometimes we don't even know where the help is coming from. Sometimes we don't know where the provision is coming from. We don't know where the victory is coming from, but Allah can help, but we have to take the steps and we have to make dua, right? So that's just a little intro um, to dua. These are some verses, I'm not going to go through all of these verses, right? But these are a couple of verses that I've chosen in the Quran where Allah speaks about dua. There's some famous verses here. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ Your Lord says, Call upon me, أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ I will respond to you. What I love about the verses relating to dua in the Quran is that usually in the Quran, I mean most of the time anyway, you will find that Allah, He speaks in third person. He created, right? He created for you, He created you, He does this, He provides and so on, right? Third person. It's very rare that Allah uses first person. Sometimes He's, in fact, what's also quite common is that Allah uses we, right? نَحْنُ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ and so on, right? We created you. But it's even rarer to find first person and Allah saying I, makes it, making it very personal. What I love about most of the Verses relating to dua is that Allah uses, makes it so personal that He says, I, Udruni, call upon me. Astajibalakum, Allah says, I will respond to you. He doesn't say, He will respond to you. He doesn't say, We will respond to you. He says, I. He makes it very personal. So that kind of already sets the tone for what dua is supposed to be. And our outlook on dua should be, it should be something personal. It shouldn't just be something which is, you know, a few seconds here and there and murmuring a few things and you know say it should be very personal the way that Allah is saying I will respond to you right imagine a VIP a celebrity someone that you respect a leader a world leader saying you know I will respond to you personally like if you email me if you send me a letter I'll send you a letter back me myself not just like someone from my team or my secretary or someone I will sign it I will you know it feels like you feel honored Allah is saying I will respond to you personally right we're going to talk about the different types of response towards the end inshallah if we get some time so this is one of the verses in the Quran then you have many ahadith relating to dua as well for example the Prophet ﷺ, he says that dua dua is ibadah dua is an act of worship and again I always mention that it's very uh, you know, uncommon for us to see dua as an act of worship when in reality it is. An act of worship we always think is something which is like salah or like hajj and umrah or something like that but we rarely see dua as an act of worship because we think dua is how can dua be an act of worship when what dua really is is just me sitting there just asking Allah for things. That doesn't really sound like an act of worship that just sounds like more like 
Allah is doing me a favor, something on the side, something like an add-on, an additional thing. But in and of itself, dua is ibadah. And what does that mean? That means, as we understand the ibadah, ibadah is something which you do for the sake of Allah, and Allah rewards you in return. So can you imagine that you are rewarded for making dua? This is amazing when you think of it like this, that dua is me actually sometimes really desperately just asking Allah for something. I need the dua. I need Allah to respond to my dua. This is helping me, benefiting me. But yet it's an ibadah, which means that I'm actually getting reward for asking Allah. That's amazing. I get reward just for sitting there and asking for something. Even if I haven't been given something, even if my dua isn't accepted, I didn't lose out because I got reward just for asking. This is how we should view dua. Right? So it's an act of worship, which means that Allah is rewarding us for it. And, you know, like normally, if you were to ask a friend, ask a family member, someone that you know, for a favor, you were to ask them, can you please do this for me? Maybe they do it for you on one occasion. You ask them again, maybe they do it for you. But you ask them three, four, five, six times, like every week you're asking them for a favor. At some point, they will get a little bit frustrated with you. Even if you're, they're a very close friend or close family member, they're going to say, always asking me for favors, you're always coming to me when you need something, you're always asking for something, right? It's natural, it's within our human nature. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the complete opposite, is that the more you ask Allah, the more it makes Allah happy and pleased that my servant is reaching out to me. And the less you ask Allah, the more displeased he becomes. And again, the Prophet mentions this in the hadith, Allah becomes displeased if you don't ask him, right? Which is amazing again, because it's like, you know, you would think that the more you ask, the more frustrated, not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah wants you to ask more and more, because this establishes that you are the servant and he is the master. You are putting your trust and your hope and everything in Allah. And dua is a demonstration of that. Because otherwise, if you didn't trust Allah, and if you didn't need Allah, then you wouldn't be asking him. Dua is amazing in that sense. You're asking Allah, showing that I'm humble enough to ask. Because, you know, trust me, there's people out there who don't want to ask Allah because they feel like, you know, I'm so independent. I can do whatever. I can do it myself. I don't need to ask Allah. And as, we, as we'll talk about, dua and istikhara can be done for the smallest of things. And it should be done for the smallest of things. We always think, I only make dua when I need something big. I only make istikhara for a big, big decision. Right? But subhanAllah, you will see even in hadith that sometimes the smallest of things we are encouraged to make dua for. And again, this establishes and affirms our true trust in Allah. And it affirms also how powerless we are. How powerless we are. I'll give you an example. So for example, like, you know, we say inshallah a lot, right? Inshallah. That's another discussion. It's not, not to do with dua, but it's kind of like a dua if you're saying if Allah wills, right? If Allah wants it for me, right? You're putting your trust in Allah. Now, sometimes again, we only say inshallah if we, you know, if, if, if for example, like the, the only times we would say inshallah is if we really want something and there's kind of like not much hope in getting it. So we say inshallah, like, you know, the more we say inshallah, the more chance maybe I might get it, right? But we don't say inshallah for things perhaps that we're guaranteed to get. I'm just like, why? Why, you know, for example, you just came right now from your home to the masjid. Maybe some of you live really close by. So you wouldn't have said leaving the home, inshallah, I'm going to get to the masjid. Because you're like, it's just down the road. I don't need to say inshallah for that, right? So there's a story of, uh, there's a, story of a man who was in a similar position, right? A similar situation where he wanted to buy a new pair of slippers, sandals. Right? It's like the smallest thing, if you think about it, right? Buying a pair of slippers or sandals, for most of us, that's kind of irrelevant. It's not a big purchase. It's not like you're purchasing a car or a house or something, right? So, as he was leaving the house, he said, I'm just going to the shops to buy some slippers. Um, I'll be back soon. And one of his family members said to him, why don't you say, inshallah, say inshallah you're going to buy it. He's like, why, is that why should I say inshallah for? It's just down, it's just, the shop is just there. I'm just going to walk there. I'm going to get the slippers. It's a small item. And I'm going to come back home again. What's the problem? And he leaves the home. And as he's walking, you know, somehow the, um, the, there was a thief who comes and takes his 
uh, purse or the wallet that he had, right? And he gets to the shop and he goes to the till, the counter, and he puts the slippers there and he's trying, he's trying to pay and now he's like, I don't have the money on me, right? And he goes home disappointed and he's like, and they're like, did you buy the slippers? He says, no, no, I didn't because I don't have any money to buy it with, right? It's very, it's a, the, the lesson here is what? That he didn't say inshallah thinking that oh, it's guaranteed. I'm walking here, it's guaranteed, right? I'm getting this, it's guaranteed, but it's not. So with the dua, you can make dua for the smallest of things. Ibn Umar, anhuma, famous companion of the Prophet he says that he used to make dua for a comfortable seat on the camel that he used to ride. Right, I'll repeat that again. The same camel he's riding every day. But he says, I used to make dua before I used to get on the camel that Allah give me a comfortable seat on this camel. It's crazy. It's like us saying today, before I get into my car, oh Allah, make my seat extra comfortable. It's like, we would never make that kind of dua. It's like, it's the smallest thing. It's, it's my car, it's the same seat. I would ride the car anyway, whatever, you know? This is the Sahaba, right? The Prophet says in the hadith that make dua and ask Allah even if it is for salt. Milh, salt. Salt, like something you can buy for pennies, right? Make dua even for that, he says. Something that we, we don't even think of. Like, we don't make dua for breakfast. We don't make dua when you go shopping. Oh Allah, give me some sugar, some, you know, some cereal. These are basic items. I'm guaranteed to get it. But this is, this is the sunnah. You ask Allah, right? So dua is an act of worship, as we said, right? So moving on from this, um, we're going to talk a little bit about dua. And then we're going to get into istikhara discussion, right? So here's a few points about dua. Uh, for example, as we know, dua is an act of worship, right? Dua is an act of worship, as we know. Um, dua also, sorry, I'm just I'm looking at this because I'm trying to follow which points there are. Um, it displays the humility of the servant. Dua displays the humility, and we've spoken about this. How dua, by performing dua, it shows that you are humbling yourself before Allah, right? That's why the best position or posture to make dua is in sujood. The Prophet says the closest that you can get, a servant can get to Allah is in sujood. Why? Because what is sujood? You are literally putting your head on the ground, humbling yourself before. There's no, there's no lower position that you can get in than sujood. And then you are asking Allah in sujood, your dua has a higher likelihood, a higher chance of being accepted in sujood. Because you are humbling yourself before Allah. So it's a sign of humility. Dua brings a servant closer to their Lord. It's one of the most honorable deeds, of course, as the Prophet mentions in the hadith. And let me pick the last three. Look at the last three, right? Dua can be made in any language, it can be made in any time, in any place. This one's really important, right? Because a lot of times we think dua is only in Arabic. And of course, the duas that we find in the Quran are in Arabic. The du'as that we find in the sunnah are in Arabic, absolutely. Those du'as are important. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, you know, Allahumma inna ka'afu. All of these du'as are in Arabic, fine. And, and you should memorize as many of those du'as as you can. But du'a is not just restricted to Arabic, meaning that once you've recited and read those du'as, it doesn't mean that you can't now make du'a in your own language. You're supposed to make du'a in your own language. Otherwise, how is it personal? Right? There's many people who don't speak Arabic, who don't understand Arabic. If you do, then that's great. But it might not be your first language. It might not be the language that you're accustomed to speaking with. So therefore, how do you communicate with Allah? Is it only in Arabic? Does Allah only understand Arabic? No, of course not. Allah is a creator of languages, right? So therefore, any language, whatever is your first language, English, Arabic, Spanish, Turkish, German, Urdu, whatever your first language is, right? You're supposed to use that to, to communicate with Allah. It can be made in any language. As opposed to another act of worship. We said dua is an ibadah. But think about salah as an ibadah. Can I perform salah in English? You can't, it's invalid. Right? Can I, uh, you know, perform, can I pray uh, Isha now, right now, at this time? You can't. There's a specific time for salah. There's a specific, specific rules that you need to follow for salah. I can't face any direction that I want for salah. I can't pray salah in any language. There's rules. There's rules for hajj and umrah. Right. I can't perform Hajj in Dublin. I have to go to a specific location 
Mecca during a specific period for Hajj, that is not Umrah, right? A specific period of time to perform the, the Hajj. And likewise, any act of worship, fasting as well. I can't fast from the night time, from Maghrib to Fajr, thinking that's an easy way out because I sleep most of the night. So I won't get hungry. You can't do that. It has to be from Fajr to Maghrib, right? So there's specific times and rules. But subhanAllah, dua is arguably the most flexible act of worship, the most flexible ibadah, because dua, there's no set language for it. You can make dua in any language. There's no set time for dua. Of course, there are some times which are more blessed than other times, yes. There are some times which there's more likelihood of dua being accepted, like for example, Fridays, Jumu'ah, like you know, certain days in the year, like Ramadan, like Laylatul Qadr, you know, certain times, the Hajjud time and so on. But as in, can I make dua right now? Can I make dua after Fajr? Can I make dua after Dhuhr? Any time? Yes. Any place as well. Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ Right? Those who remember Allah whilst they are standing and sitting and lying down on their sides. Right? You can't do that with Salah. Right? But with dua, can I do that? Yeah. Can I make dua whilst I'm in bed before I go to sleep at night? Just lying down? Can I, can I make dua? You can. We, we should. Because there's certain duas and supplications that you recite. Right? Allahumma bismika amut wa ahiyya. And you're making dua to Allah. There's certain, you know, ayat al kursi, etc. Can I do that while I'm lying down? Does it have to be before I get into bed? You can do it lying down. You can do it sitting. You can do it, you know, whilst driving your car. You can do it anywhere, in any place. So dua is extremely flexible. And that's the beauty of dua. Right? And that's something that we're going to come back to. But in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about how long you spend making dua. So I want you to just take out 30 seconds right now before we talk about istikhara. And the question is, just to elaborate on this question, I want you to think about on a daily basis or you know, regularly, when you sit and make dua, on average, how long do you sit and make dua for? On average, when you sit and make dua, how long do you sit and make dua for? I'm not talking about the total, if you make dua after every salah, you're going to add that up. No, I'm talking about on average, generally, when you sit and make dua, how long do you sit there for and make dua? Is it seconds, minutes, what, like what is it? So just think for 30 seconds, have a quick think, because sometimes you have to think about this, right? Just think about the past week or two. Think about when you make dua, whenever it was after salah or whenever. And how long generally do I sit there and make dua for? Just have a quick think about that. I'll come back to you in a second. Okay. So think about your dua duration. <clears throat> and... Um, for how many of you would say your dua, on average, that one dua that you normally make is less than a minute? Just put your hand up if you think that is your, that's the case for you. Less than a minute. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a safe space. No one's judging anyone. Just, you know, be honest with yourselves. How many of you think it's about two to three minutes on average, your dua? Okay, great. How many of you would say your dua is more than five minutes? Okay, good. Okay, so have, have, so so let's think about this, right? Let's just quickly, just quickly analyze this for a second, because I've asked this question a lot of times in different places that I've been, and it always kind of drops. The the hands, the number of hands drop as I get to about the five minute mark. It drops. <clears throat> Ten fifteen minutes is out of the question, because some people they ask the question like, how can I make du'a for ten minutes? Five minutes. Maybe 10 minutes. Like, what do you want me to sit there and do? Like, recite Surah Baqarah or something? Like, what, what is this? 10 minutes? What do I do in 10 minutes? This is the problem, you see, because the person who's saying that assumes that the only function of dua is just to ask Allah for things. So they're like, 10 minutes? How can I ask Allah for 10 minutes straight? I don't have that much of a Christmas wish list, you know? Like, I don't have that much that I need to ask Allah, Allah, give me this, 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 and be... Okay. 
So that's assuming that that's what du'a is, but remember that's not just what du'a is because du'a, we already defined it and we said literally du'a means to call out to Allah. It doesn't say du'a means to request something specific from Allah, it means just to call out to Allah. And a call to Allah can be different things. It doesn't just need to be asking Allah for things. It can be, for example, uh, telling Allah what you're grateful for. It could just be complaining to Allah and telling Allah how you feel, trying to process your feelings and your emotions at that point, complaining to Allah, all of these things. For example, if you look at Prophet Zakariya salam, Surah Maryam, at the beginning of Surah Maryam, Allah tells us about Zakariya salam, great prophet of Allah. And Zakariya salam, he was struggling because he wanted to have a child. And he was a very old man at this point. And his wife was also old. And they've never had kids. And they've been trying and they didn't have kids. Allah decided that they want to have kids, right? But now Zakariya salam, he is making dua to Allah. And Allah records this dua at the beginning of Surah Maryam. Right? And if you look at, if you just read those verses, it's amazing. Because it's not your typical dua, the way that we see dua. The way that we would have done it is, Ya Allah, grant me a child, please. That's how it would have been. But Zakariya Ali Islam, what is he doing? Allah says, he calls out to Allah firstly, in secret, by himself. And he says, Qala Rabbi, inni al-adnu minni wa al rasu Oh Allah, my... I am, I've become very old, my bones have become very weak, and grey hair has spread around my head. And oh Allah, you've never let me down when I've made dua to you. And oh Allah, I fear for my ancestors and my offspring that come after me. And my wife, she's never been able to have kids. Right? And he just, can, it's like, doesn't Allah know all of this? Why is he stating the obvious for? Doesn't Allah know that he has grey hairs on his head? Doesn't Allah know that he's an old man? Allah knows that he's, you know, uh, he's, he's, he's weak now because he's old. Allah knows that his wife can't have kids. He's like listing all of these problems to Allah. How does that make sense? But then at the very end of all of these listing, 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 then he mentions, Oh Allah, grant me from yourself, through your favor, grant me a child. Who will inherit from me and inherit from the family of Yaqub. And Allah, make him someone who you are pleased with. So what was the point of all of this? He's having a conversation with Allah. Saying to Allah, this is how I feel. This is why I want to have a kid. This is what I want. This is what, I, what I'm feeling. And he's spelling it out to Allah. This is why we're struggling to make dua for more than 2-3 minutes. Because we only see dua as something which is just ask Allah. Speak to Allah, complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want Allah to speak to you, then you pick up the Qur'an, you read the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is kalamullah, the Qur'an is the word of Allah. Allah is speaking to you, it's a message to you. If you want to speak to Allah, then you should raise your hands and you make dua to Allah. This is your chance to speak to Allah and have a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So speak to Allah, complain to Allah, speak to Him, right? Like Musa I'll give you this one final example before we move on to istikhara. Musa salam. Allah says to Musa salam, when Musa salam, as we know, he would speak to Allah and he would carry with him what? What would Musa salam carry in his hand a lot? What would Musa salam carry? Yeah, the staff, the stick, right? So Allah asks Musa salam, wa ma tilka bi yaminika ya Musa. What is in your right hand, O Musa? What is in your right hand? Okay, so imagine you ask me that question right now. What is in your right hand? I would say, my phone. What else? Right? So Musa is asked, what is in your right hand? And at this point, he's holding his stuff. He says, Hiya asai. It is my stuff. Atawakka'u alayha. I use it to lean with. I use it to lean on. Wa'ahushu biha ala ghanami. And I use it to beat down the leaves so that, you know, things can fall for my cattle. وَلِيَ فِيهَا مَآلِبُ أُخْرَىٰ And it has many benefits in it as well. Okay. Did Allah ask him for the benefits and why he has it? Allah just asked him a simple question. What is in your right hand? It would have been sufficient for him to say, my staff. But he continued and he continued and he, continued. he added three more things. It's like me saying, this is my phone. I use it to WhatsApp message people and I use it to call other people and I use it to communicate with the world. You say, I didn't ask you that. Why are you prolonging the conversation for? But who was Musa Islam speaking to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why would he want to cut his conversation short with Allah? So he's saying to Allah, Yes, Allah, this is my staff. 
But he doesn't want to terminate the conversation. He wants to keep, this is my chance to speak to Allah. So yes, Ya Allah, I use this to lean on. And I use it to benefit my cattle. And it has many other objectives as well. And then he ran out of things to say. Now that, then Allah asked the next question. Do you see? This is how we should see our dua with Allah. Like, don't terminate your dua straight away. Use it to speak to Allah and tell Allah what, what you're going through and what you're experiencing. And it doesn't have to just be asking Allah. It can just be processing things and you know, telling Allah what you're struggling with or what you're grateful for even and, and, and so on. Because this has an impact on your dua. Excellent. Let's move on because... Istikhara, normally by the way, I give a, a half day seminar on istikhara in and of itself. Right? So normally I spend minimum three to four hours on istikhara. Obviously we don't have that time. So we have half an hour, 40 minutes. Inshallah, inshallah. Yes, inshallah. Right? But today, unfortunately, we don't have that much time. So it's going to be a very quick summary of istikhara. So I apologize if I'm kind of rushing. Okay, so let's follow this. Let's introduce ourselves to istikhara. Right, I'm going to move up slightly just so we can see this properly, right? So, what is the definition, what is the meaning of istikhara firstly, right? Istikhara, what does it mean? Al-istikhara. It means to seek Allah's counsel, to seek Allah's guidance in a matter, in a decision that you're making. Okay, that is what istikhara means, okay? Leaving it to Allah, asking Allah for his guidance in a particular matter, no matter how big, no matter how small that thing is, okay? What is the ruling of istikhara? Istikhara is a sunnah. Istikhara is an established sunnah. It is an emphasized sunnah, actually, when you will realize this from the hadith. And finally, what is the best way to perform the istikhara? The best way, not the only way, but the best way is to perform two rak'at of salah, of nafil prayer. And then following the salah is to read the dua, the specific dua of istikhara which we will go through, we will break down the dua of istikhara. This is, this is the best method. Pray two rak'at and then read the dua of istikhara. And this is, the reason why I say the best method is because this is how the Prophet taught it to the companions. But there's other ways. For example, even if you didn't perform the two rak'at of salah and you just read the dua of istikhara, this is sufficient. It is also fine, but it's not the most effective way. Right, so there's different ways, and we're going to talk about the manner in which you can perform istikhara. Now, what is always missing from the istikhara discussion is that many people fail to understand that istikhara is one of two components. This istikhara of yours cannot be effective without the other component, the secondary component, and that is something known as istishara. Istikhara goes hand in hand with istishara. You must do both, and in fact, istishara comes before istikhara. Not the other way around. You don't do istikhara and then do istishara. Okay, now, what is istishara? Let's break it down. Okay, istishara, in very, very simple terms, and it's based on this hadith, where the Prophet he says, وَمَا نَدِمَ مَنْ اسْتَخَارَ الْخَالِقِ وَشَاوَرَ الْمَخْلُوقِينَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَتَثَبَّتَ فِي أَمْرِهِ Right? That whoever seeks the counsel or the guidance of the Creator of Allah, meaning through istikhara, مَا نَدِمَ will not regret that decision that they're making, right? And this is why istikhara is so important. Because, you know, if you make a decision by yourself, okay, that I feel like this is best for me, and you do it, it you could end up with a lot of regrets when things don't go your way. But you were just to do istikhara, and even if it was the same outcome, you shouldn't have any regrets. Because you would say what? At least I did istikhara, and at least I asked Allah, even though the outcome wasn't what I wanted, but I know that this must be what Allah wanted for me. That's, the, that's literally the difference between doing istikhara and not doing istikhara. Because the other one would be that, well, you know, I thought it was best for me. There's more disappointment. Because you trusted yourself more than anyone else. You thought you knew better than everyone else, right? So the Prophet says that this person will not have any regret. But there's a secondary component. وَشَاوَرَ الْمَخْلُوقِينَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And... They did istishara, meaning they also sought counsel and advice from the believers, their, their, their companions, right? Those around them. And at the end of it, they were able to be firm in that decision of this. Okay? We're living in a world now where many of us are indecisive. We don't know even you know, what decision to make. Even in small decisions, we don't know, okay, there's a food menu and there's 15 items on the menu. Which one do I choose? Right? This is like, you know, open up Netflix. Which film do I watch? So the next hour is, which film should I watch? 
We're so indecisive, we don't even know what to do these days, right? I'm not saying you do istikhara before Netflix, which one? Right? That's, don't, don't get my message wrong. I'm saying that we're just so indecisive, obviously now that's going to spill over into the important decisions in life. So therefore, at least for the important decisions, and by the way, of course, what's important to you may not be important to me and, and vice versa. So for you, it might be something small, but it's important to you. So do istikhara for it, right? So these are the two components. So istishara in very simple terms, it's also known as shura. There's a whole surah in the Quran called Surah al-Shura. It's also called uh, mashwara, mushawara. Right? You've probably heard of this term before. It is simply what? Just getting someone else's opinion, a second opinion, right? Getting feedback from someone else, seeking advice, seeking counsel from trusted sources. This is the first component, even before you do the istikhara. Imam al-Nawi, rahimahullah, he said, and it's recommended before istikhara to consult someone whom you know is sincere, is caring and has experience and is trustworthy regarding their knowledge, right? Before you do istikhara, what do you do? You go to someone who is sincere. That's important because you could go to someone who is not very sincere, doesn't want what's best for you. You need to go to someone who wants what's best for you, right? And you need to go to someone who has experience, has experience in that thing as well. What's the point going to someone, you know, you're looking to get married? And then you go and ask your 16-year-old friend, hey, what advice do you have for me? <laughs> Why are you asking that? Go to someone who has experience, who's already married themselves and been through it, right? You're you know, getting advice for a career in medicine. And then you go to someone in finance. Hey, uh, can you give me some? They're like, this is not my field. So you go to someone who has experience. This is this something else. Experience doesn't have to mean they have to be really old in their 80s, 90s, something like that. But at least there's some grounding in what it is that you're asking. And also knowledge in, in terms of religious commitment as well. You need to, they need to be someone who's trustworthy in that sense. So this is the first component before istikhara, istishara. Why is this important for? Because again... A misconception on istikhara is that you just jump straight to istikhara. You jump straight to istikhara and you do istikhara, you ask Allah, you make dua, and then we'll see how things go. Most people that I've spoken to do istikhara when they're not even sure on what to do. Most people, they have, sometimes it's like between two options, right? It doesn't always have to be. Sometimes it's between two options. They don't even know which option is good. So they do istikhara immediately. Even if there's not two options, even if it's just one thing in front of you, they're not sure. Their heart is not inclined. So what do they do? Istikhara and I just hope that Allah will resolve this for me. No, before istikhara you do istikhara. Why? What does istikhara do? It gives you some kind of direction. Your heart is already inclining towards something. This is how istikhara should be done. The myth, number one misconception of istikhara is that I, I do it when I have no bias or no leaning towards it or no inclination. No, I'm not saying be so biased that regardless you know, of, of what's happening in your life, you still are stubborn and you still wanna, you want that thing, right? What I'm saying is have some inclination towards it, right? So it, it's like two job offers as an example. Two job offers. You don't know which one to go for. So you do isti shara first. You go and you speak to people and you get their advice and so on. And they may say, yeah, this one looks better for this reason and so on. So you have some kind of inclination. Okay, this one I think is a little bit better based on these reasons, right? Then you do istikhara. And then istikhara will open up the doors. You know, it, it may be that it's up to you now to decide which one. Right? Again, istikhara, we think it's like some, some magic wand where, you know, the decision is going to be made for you. You're, you're still a human being, you still have free will, right? Allah is not just gonna just, you know, magically resolve everything for you. You still need to make a decision, right? So when you make that decision, you've done istikhara, you've done istikhara, now you can just say, okay, I'm gonna go for option A, not option B. Not option B because of the reasons and, you know, I did my, and inshallah this feels, this feels right to do. So this is the important part, is always do istishara beforehand. And this is what the Prophet was told in the Quran. وَشَاوِرُهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ even the Prophet ﷺ, who receives guidance and revelation from Allah, was told, Shawirhum fil amr. Do mashwara, seek counsel from the companions in important matters. Even though he receives guidance and revelation from Allah, wahi, he was still told, get the opinions of your companions. 
فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ In the following part of the verse فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ Only when, O Prophet, you are resolute and determined and you are firm in your decision فَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then place your tawakkul and your trust in Allah Right? So what, what are we being told here? That you have to be firm and then you put your trust in Allah Meaning that you do your istishara You make a firm decision and then you do your istikhara not the other way around, where you're unsure, you're wavering, you're in doubt, you do istikhara, then you speak to some people, and then, no. Always be, try to be a bit more firm in your decision, right? Otherwise, it's indecisive. So, istishara first, make mashwara, get the counsel of people that you trust around you, and now you're going to do your istikhara, okay? Now, what is istikhara? Right, you probably won't be able to see this very clearly, but this is the hadith broken down, which is that, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to teach us istikhara, the way that he used to teach us verses from the Quran. Right? And he says that if you have an important decision to make, then you should perform two rak'at of optional prayer, nafil prayer, min ghayr al okay? And then you recite the following dua. So just like any normal two rak'at prayer, you will pray. Right? Is there a specific time for it? There's no specific time. Do some scholars recommend that you pray in the night time? Yes, they do. Recommend it, but it's not a must. You can pray beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day, no problem, right? It's just typical nafil prayer. Then following the nafil prayer, following this, you will then, after the salah, recite the dua of istikhara, right? Which is the English transliteration is here. Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmika wa astakhiruka bi qudratika wa asaluka min fadlika al -azim. And the dua goes on. I just want to quickly highlight what the meaning of this dua. Because what, again, a lot of people, what we do is we just read the dua in Arabic. We didn't understand what the dua means. And then we just hope that Allah is going to make our istikhara effective. Look at the meaning of the istikhara dua. You will see that the meaning in and of itself is explaining so much. The meaning in and of itself is telling you a lot about the istikhara. You're understanding what's happening. Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmika. Oh Allah, I consult you. I reach out to you through your great knowledge. Right? وَأَسْتَقْدِرُكَ بِقُدْرَتِكَ And I seek strength through your power. وَأَسْأَلُكَ مِنْ فَضْلِكَ الْعَظِيمِ And I ask you of your great bounty. فَإِنَّكَ تَقْدِرُ وَلَا أَقْدِرُ Because, oh Allah, you are capable and I am not capable. وَتَعْلَمُ وَلَا أَعْلَمُ And, oh Allah, you have knowledge and I don't have that knowledge. وَأَنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوبِ And you are the knower of the unseen. That's the kind of intro to the dua. It's basically affirming some of Allah's attributes. Now it's the main part of the dua, right? Which is as follows. Allahumma in kunta ta'lamu anna hadha al-amra khayrun li. Right? Oh Allah, if you know that this matter, and some of the scholars, they recommend you do what? At this point, you mention or you think of what it is that you're doing the istikhara for. Oh Allah, if you know that this matter, this job, this offer, this decision, whatever it is, is khayrun li, is good for me. Fi, in what? In terms of what? Good for me in terms of what? Fi dini, number one. In terms of my deen. In terms of my deen, my faith, right? Wa ma'ashi, and in terms of my livelihood. Wa aqibati amri, and in terms of the consequences of my affairs, right? Then, O oh Allah, do what? Faqdurhu li. Then, O oh Allah, ordain it for me. Ordain it for me. Decree that thing for me. وَيَسِّرْهُ لِي And make it easy for me. ثُمَّ بَالِكْ لِي فِي And oh Allah bless me in this thing. So you have told Allah, you're saying to Allah, Oh Allah, if you know that this thing is good for me, and it benefits my deen. An example of that might be, if you were to take a certain job, it may not be good for your deen. This person, not, they're not going to let you pray salah. They're not going to let you be uh, visibly Muslim. They're not going to let you dress in a particular way. They're not going to you know, allow you time off for Jumu'ah, for Eid, etc. It's not good for your deen. This is what you're asking Allah. If it's, if it's good for my deen, then make it easy for me and bless me in this thing, right? So you have to, you have to open up your heart to Allah and say, if it's good for my livelihood, well, my ashi as well, if it's good for the end of my affairs, if it's good for my akhirah, all of these things, then Allah ordain it for me and make it easy and bless me. And then on the opposite, on the other hand, you're saying, but oh Allah, Allahumma in kunta ta'lam, if you know, anna hadha al-amra sharrun li, if it's evil, if it's bad for me, fi dini, in the same things, in, in terms of my deen, if it's bad for me, if it's bad for me, in terms of my, you know, my livelihood, my affairs, and so on. Then what are you asking Allah? فَصْرِفْهُ anni, وَصْرِفْنِي anhu. Then Allah, turn it away from me, and turn me away from it. Right? It's amazing. You're saying to Allah, 
this opportunity, whatever it is, turn it away from me. Take it away from me. And not only that, but take me away from it. That's amazing because sometimes the opportunity can be taken away from you, but your heart is still with that opportunity. Right? So you're saying, take, take me away from it as well. I don't want to have regrets. Or I don't want to keep thinking about that same thing now. I want to completely move on from it because I know that it wasn't good for me. Right? And then at the very end, right? وَقْدُرْلِي الْخَيْرَ حَيْثُ كَانْ ثُمَّ أَرْضِنِي بِهِ And oh Allah, grant me power to do good or grant me good wherever it may be. And at the end, ثُمَّ أَرْضِنِي بِهِ or ثُمَّ رَضِّنِي بِهِ Oh Allah, cause me to be content with it. Give me contentment with it. Because again, sometimes we make a decision, it was a rash decision, it wasn't the right decision. And then what happens ultimately is we regret the decision and then we keep thinking about it and we're not content. What we're looking for in life is contentment. We're not looking for happiness. All of us we say, what do you want? I want to be happy. I want to be happy, I want to be happy, right? There's no such thing as pure happiness in this life. We know that for a fact. Because happiness only ha it has a threshold, it has a limit. You can be happy for a day or two or a couple of days, a few weeks even. But something will happen that will cause that emotion to change. You can't be happy non-stop. Right? It's impossible because something's going to irritate you. Something will anger you. Something will sadden you. Right? It's just the nature of life, unfortunately. This, is, this life is full of tests. So for someone to say, my life, my life's purpose and objective is to be happy, it is a flawed purpose. It just doesn't make sense. You can't be happy all the time. Right? You can't be happy and smiling all the time because life will bring things your way. Right? Allah has decreed other things. But if you say that I want to be content, that's something else. Because even if something irritates you, even if something bad is happening in your life, even if there's a test, can you still be content? You might not be happy. It doesn't mean that you have to be happy with everything that's happening in your life, but you can be content that I left it with Allah. I placed my trust in Allah. I did istikhar. I did, I did whatever I could. I made dua. So I'm content even if I'm not completely 100% happy with the circumstances in my life. It's not perfect. But alhamdulillah, you know, it could be worse. Alhamdulillah, you know, I've seen some wisdoms and benefits behind why such and such thing has happened. So aim for contentment. And this is what istikhara does. Ultimately, it allows you to have contentment in the decisions that you're making. Right? This is the dua for istikhara. It's very simple. You can read the Arabic. You can read the English translation. You can even read the English translation. And really understand what it is that you're asking Allah for. That Allah, if it's good for me, then ordain it. If it's bad for me, take me away from it. Don't be so biased that even if something is bad for you, even if people are telling you, hey, don't do this. Right? You're still saying, no, I want to do it. Why? Because I'm following my desire. I feel like it's good for me. No, sometimes Allah is going to close the doors for you. Sometimes He's going to send people to you to tell you, right? And they're genuinely giving you advice, don't do this. Right? And you're still going to say, no, no, no I'm going to do it. Right? Then you can't blame anyone but yourself. So istikhara is this kind of, you're opening up to Allah and you're asking Allah to guide you in this. Right? So now the question is, and this is the main question that a lot of people ask, okay, what, what's, what's next? I've done istikhara, what next? Right? What's going to happen now? Am I going to look in the, the sky and I'm going to see something now? This is what people expect. Istikhara is this revelation is going to come down. I'm going to see an angel or something. What's going to happen next, right? What happens next is you move on with your life. You carry on. What else is there to do, right? Literally, you just, you've placed your trust. You've done the istikhara. Place your trust in Allah. Allah will facilitate. But we get too technical. No, but tell me how. Tell me what Allah will do for me. How will it be facilitated? Is there a sign? Is there something? Right? No, Allah is going to facilitate it for you. He's going to lead you to the best outcome. Salah is at 12.50. Okay, so we have like 20 minutes maybe, inshallah. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Inshallah. Okay, so you trust that Allah will facilitate for you. This, this is what happens next, right? 
Meaning that there's no way, you can't, I can't spell it out for you. I can't tell you exactly what that is, but you just trust that Allah will facilitate. You carry on with your life. You don't stop your life. You don't pause your life based on this decision. You carry on, right? But you're hoping that in the background, Allah will facilitate for you, right? A, a tip would be, don't take too many different viewpoints or pieces of advice on, right? This is one brother I spoke to a while back. Um, last year, at some point, I spoke to him. And it was about marriage and things, he was looking to get married, etc. And he said to me, um, I've spoken to 40 different scholars on this. I said, 40? He's like, yeah, you're like the 41st. <laughs> it's like, why? Well, firstly, why? Why are you going to so many, like speaking to scholars from all across the globe? SubhanAllah. It's like every country I'm going to speak to someone. And, and for them to give me. By the end of it, this guy, poor guy was so confused. Because each, every, every single scholar gave him a different view, different opinion. Now he's like, I don't know which one to follow now. I just sat him down. I said, firstly, you made a big mistake asking so many people. Half of them you don't even know. Most of them you don't even know. Right? He knew me personally. Apart from that, he's just messaging random people, asking for advice. Right? Like we said, go to trusted people, people that you know. Right? And don't take too many opinions on either. Because if you take so many opinions on, it's going to confuse you more. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a viewpoint. Right? You can't, you can't, you're going to be left confused. So pick two or three people maybe. And that's it. Those two, three people need to be solid references for you. You go and ask them. Don't take too much on, otherwise it's going to confuse you even more, right? Don't neglect dua and prayer. So some people, they pray istikhara, but they're not praying there five times daily salah. They're not making dua generally, right? Continue your dua, continue your salah as normal, continue as normal, right? And even in your salah, in your dua, you keep asking Allah for guidance in this thing. Istikhara is not just the one-off thing and then you move on. It continues throughout, right? Allah will bless you regardless of the outcome. This is what, again, it's difficult to understand. But ultimately, whatever happens in the end, whatever decision you make in the end, that is the result of your istikhara. The outcome or the result of your istikhara is whatever happens in the end. Whatever decision you go for, that is the result of istikhara. Whatever happens in your life over the next few weeks and months and years, that is the result of your istikhara. That's it. There's nothing else to consider or to think about, right? It's not something special in your life that's going to happen. That's just how istikhara works. And look, if you're still uncomfortable or if you're still unsure, uncertain, then you can just repeat the process. I mean, you can do istikhara again, not a problem. If you're unsure, you can speak to someone again and get a second piece of advice. Or you can just do istikhara multiple times, not a problem. Three times, it's one of the Sahaba mentioned he did it three times. Some say even up to seven times you can do, no problem. It's a nafil prayer, remember. Istikhara, there's no set rules for istikhara, so you can do istikhara as many times as you want. So, this is something important to mention again because sometimes we're expecting something in our lives. For example, we're expecting, and this is again the next big misconception. You're probably waiting for me to mention this. When do I see the dream then? When am I, when, like, at what point do I see the, the dream? At what point do I see the sign? Right? There's no dream or sign, I'm sorry to say. Firstly, this is not from Islam, right? From the Sharia, from Islam, there's no mention in the Quran, in the Sunnah, that you are going to see a dream or a sign following your istikhara. This is something which became based on cult culture or based on personal experiences of some people, it became popularized. Some people do see dreams, I am not rejecting that idea. Some people do see dreams. Some people dream more than others, right? My wife, has way more dreams than I do. Because she tells me some of the dreams. I'm like, it sounds like a movie, man. Like literally, she's like describing all I'm like, my dreams are so boring compared to yours. Some people just generally have dreams more often, more regular, more descriptive, right? More vivid. And some people actually have dreams that do come true. I'm not denying this. The Prophet actually did mention that dreams are 170th of prophethood, right? So some people can have dreams and some people's dreams can come true. But it doesn't mean everyone's dream is going to come true. It doesn't mean every dream you have is relevant. It doesn't mean every dream, there's a meaning behind it. Most of the dreams that we have are just random things that maybe you were watching TikTok before you went to sleep that night and the TikTok video was about cats. And then in your dream that night you saw cats because psychologically that's just how it works. You plant something in your mind before you go to sleep, you're probably going to dream about that thing. Right? So the more you think about something, the more probably you're going to dream about it. It's just, it's natural, guys. Okay? So... Most of our dreams, this is a mishmash and it's just random things and that's just, how, that's just how it works, right? 
So there's no dream. It's not from the sunnah. It doesn't, it doesn't mention anywhere here in this hadith or anywhere that you're going to see a dream. You're going to see a sign, right? It doesn't work that way, okay? And the example that I always give is as follows. Look, <clears throat> let's take five daily prayers, okay? Let's just take Fajr, for example, right? Fajr is what? Is it sunnah? Is, is, it, is it a sunnah to pray Fajr or is it recommended or what? What is, what is Fajr prayer? It's fard. You have to pray Fajr, okay? Fajr time, is it generally, do we believe it's a blessed time? Yes or no? It's a blessed time, okay? So imagine I pray Fajr. Let's say today after Fajr, I prayed Fajr and after Fajr I made dua to Allah. I just made dua, just raise my hands after Fajr as we would normally do. Make some dua to Allah, ask Allah for guidance and help in, in something, okay? Do any of you, after making dua after Fajr or after any salah, do you expect a dream afterwards? Do you expect a sign afterwards? What do you expect afterwards? Just, you continue with life, right? You just, if, if it happens, it happens, if it doesn't. Okay, that's Fajr, which is a fard, which is at a blessed time when you make dua. Now, istikhara is a sunnah. Istikhara is not more important than Fajr, right? Now, we pray istikhara, which is a nafil, it's not a fard. And then what do we do? We expect what? A dream afterwards? Tell me how does that make sense? Your dua after Fajr was more important than your istikhara. Yet, after istikhara you're expecting this amazing dream or sign. But you don't expect it for your day-to-day dua. Isn't istikhara just another dua? Yes or no? It is, right? So why, why with this one do we expect some amazing outcomes? And for that one we don't. This is what I wanted to think about because we, we clearly have overcomplicated this istikhara. We're expecting a dream. Yeah, of course, it would make life so much easier if every single one of us, every Muslim in the world, if you did istikhara and straight after that night you had a dream and in your dream the answer was there. That would be amazing. But guess what? That's reserved for the Anbiya. The Anbiya, their dreams were revelation. Our dreams are not revelation. Our dreams, some of it can be truthful, but most of the time it's not. So we can't expect a dream every single time. And even if you did let's just say, have a dream. You can't pin, you can't pin a life decision on a dream that you had, because you don't know if that dream, like I said, it could have just been you were thinking about that thing so much, right? And signs, again, this sign business is quite a funny one, because you could, my, my point is, again, I'm not, I'm not saying Allah can't send you signs in your life, because there's many people that have received signs and they've, you know, they, they, they've come closer to Allah because of the signs in their life. I'm not denying that, but I'm, what I'm saying is, based on istikhara, especially if it's such a major life decision that you need to make, you can't base it on a sign, because a sign, psychologically, I can interpret anything to be a sign. There's a funny story about a guy who wanted to marry a girl by the name of Maryam. So he, he did istikhara. But oh Allah, I want to get married to this. If it's good for me, then make it good for me. Then he went to the masjid that day, and the imam was reciting Surah Maryam. He said, Ya Allah, thank you, this is it. I'm going to marry her now. The Imam just happened to recite Surah Maryam and you think, he interpreted that as his sign. Now I can interpret anything as my sign. Does that make sense? That's just how it is. If it's a job, right, and then, you know, it's a job of a certain company, let's just say. And then I'm driving on the motorway and a van passes by and it's that same company. I'm going to say, this is my sign from Allah. You interpret anything, right? So my point is that don't make this, Islam is not based on feelings. It's not based on signs. It's not based on dreams. This is not what Islam is. Islam is not based on a feeling of yours. It's not based on any of these things, external things. Islam is based on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is in control, not the dream or anything. So if you're going to make a decision, especially if it's a life decision, don't just base it on this dream or something like that. Base it on more than that. Yeah, the dream could be a factor if you did have a dream. The sign could be a factor, but that shouldn't be the, the cause, the reason. There's many other things, as we said, the istishara that you did, the istikhara, the, the, the general positives, you know, just be practical about things, right? So, let me see if I can summarize everything for you here in this uh, diagram. Okay, so starting from the top, you have an important decision to make. You have a decision to make in general. Remember, istikhara doesn't have to be for just marriage, right, or just you know, an important decision. Istikhara can be for any decision in life, right? It could just be something small. For example, you, you all heard of Imam Bukhari? Imam Bukhari? Have you heard of Sahih al-Bukhari? The, the, the most famous hadith collection. It is the most authentic book after the Quran, Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he is the author. He's, he collated all of these hadith, right? In Sahih al-Bukhari, there's more than 7,000 hadith 
more than 7,000 hadith and narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari. Think about this, right? And Imam Bukhari himself, he narrates, he says, that as I was compiling, obviously it was a project that took him many, many years. As I was compiling, he says, Sahih al-Bukhari, before I included any hadith in the hadith collection, I would go make wudu, perform two rakat, istikhara, make dua of istikhara, and then I would include the hadith in my collection. Right? So that means how many times would he have had to have performed istikhara? Minimum 7,000 times. Because every hadith, he says, before I included it, I did istikhara for it. For him, that was his important decision. He didn't have to do that, but for him, it was like such a blessed project and task that I'm working on, I need to do istikhara. So for you, it could be something like that. For you, it doesn't have to be the big, big major life decision. It could just be day to day. It could be something small. It could be before buying a car. It could be before you choose which course you're going to study, which career you're going to go into. It could be, you know, based on any, anything, right? Should I travel here to this country or something? Should I move to this place? It could be all of these things. It could be even smaller than that. Not a problem. Do istikhara for all of these things. So whatever it is, you have a decision to make. The next thing is you weigh the options and you consult with others. Right. You yourself weigh the options, think about what the pros and cons are. Then you go and consult with those two, three core people that you've chosen, that you trust, that are sincere, that have knowledge, experience. You go and get their opinions on this. Now that you've done that, the next step is you do the main istikhara prayer. You perform the two rakat and you make the dua of istikhara. Okay. Following that now, once you've done that, you continue with your life. But you also continue making dua and you place your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And then the final step is that Allah will facilitate for you. Allah will grant you what is best. Allah will grant you what is best regardless. Even if that thing, you don't like it, you don't like the outcome, you don't like the decision. But what Allah has chosen for you will be the best decision. Right? And again, Sometimes you dislike something, but it is good for you. Sometimes you like something, but it's not good for you. Allah, Allah knows and you do not know. Allah has the knowledge and you don't have the knowledge. This is why istikhara, you submitted to Allah and you said, oh Allah, if you know that this is good for me, then Allah, you grant this for me. This is what life is. Life is based on these decisions. It's based on these istikharas and these du'as. So a lot of the times we have to trust that Allah will guide us, even if it's not good. Right? And there's plenty of examples from my own life, from, from people that I know who wanted one thing, Something else happened, but that ended up being good for them. Or there was a blip, there was something bad that happened in their life, bad, that, so they thought, but it turned out to be good. Even if istikhara-wise, I was hoping that there was another outcome, right? You know, it didn't work out, alhamdulillah, something else happened over time. Sometimes time, it shows you. Time is the best kind of healer, right? Over time, you realize Allah will show you that this is best, but immediately, this is the thing about dua, we want immediate response, we want immediate results, we want to see dua in front of us, but we can't, it's impossible. So this is a, a basic summary of istikhara, right, what we're going to, as we're coming to the end now, last few minutes, is just going to quickly speak about now, whether it's istikhara or whether it's your dua, why isn't my dua being accepted? It's a big frustration, there's probably some, some of you here who have made dua for something, but you haven't been given that thing, you've asked Allah for something specific, you weren't given that thing. Why isn't my dua being responded to? Why isn't my dua being accepted? This is very important for us to understand because again, istikhara and dua, generally speaking, you need to understand this because Allah promised in the Quran, if you call upon me, I will respond. But this is the thing. There is a difference between dua being accepted and dua being responded to. Allah did not promise, if you make dua and call upon me, I will accept every dua that you make. He promised response. Does that make sense? Right? If Allah promised response, that means He will respond. That doesn't mean you're guaranteed everything you ask for. Even if you're the best Muslim in the world, that doesn't mean that you're going to be given everything that you want. Because otherwise, what difference is there between dunya and jannah? Jannah is the place where you get to ask for whatever you want, whatever you desire, and before you even ask, you will get that's the place where you get everything you desire and want. But dunya is not for that. Dunya, you can't ask for something and straight away, you get it the next day. Or you get it immediately. Right? You can't rush these things. Okay? So, in terms of why isn't my dua accepted, Allah has promised response. And the Prophet tells us there are three types of response to your dua. There are three types of response to your dua. 
Response number one is the ideal outcome for most of us or all of us here. Response number one is that Allah will accept your dua and Allah will give you what it is that you asked for. Allah will grant you your request. That is the first type of response. But that's not going to happen all the time. That happens sometimes. So sometimes you probably make dua almost immediately. Allah grants you that dua. Sometimes you make dua and it doesn't happen immediately, but it happens after some time. That is Allah giving you your request. And just in that, by the way, just to tell you, just to let you know, that sometimes Allah can delay one of Allah's names, 99 names of Allah, one of them is Al-Muqaddim and Al-Mu'akhir. Al-Muqaddim is the one who, he brings things forward, and Al-Mu'akhir is the one who delays things. Sometimes you've made dua in 2023 for something, and Allah doesn't accept your dua until 2026. And in that time, you're thinking, you're getting frustrated. Allah is not responding. Allah is not giving me. Why, why, why? And then Allah gives you it, but at the right time. Allah knows not just what is good for you. He knows when it is good for you. Right. Allah knows when it is good for you. So sometimes you think that this job or this thing or this person or this opportunity or this decision has to happen now. But Allah is saying that, look, I'm not saying no. I'm just saying not yet. I'm not saying no. I'm just saying not yet. So I'm not saying no to your request, I'm just saying, look, it'll be best for you at this point in time. And again, in my life, I can tell you, hands down, that so many times I thought something would be good for me now, Allah gave it, but it was much later. And then I realized, okay, at this point now, I feel ready for this thing, right? If this opportunity came two years ago, I wouldn't have been ready for it. But Allah gave it two years later, and now I feel more ready for this opportunity. So Allah sometimes delays things. That's number one, Allah gives, either immediately or after delay. The second response is that if Allah does not give you here immediately, then when would Allah give you something? In the Akhirah. Sometimes you don't get that thing in the dunya at all, you will get it in the Akhirah. That is the second type of response. So Allah did respond to you. It wasn't the ideal response for you, but it is from Allah's perspective, He responded and He has reserved something for you in the Akhirah, which is far better and far greater. And our Prophet Sami tells us that there's going to be people in the Akhirah, going to Jannah, and they're going to see the things that have been stored for them. And it was as a result of their du'as not being accepted. They're going to see what Allah has substituted and given them something better. And they are going to say, I wish none of my du'as were accepted in the dunya. Because if none of my du'as were accepted, I would have had more here. SubhanAllah, right? Whereas we want everything to be given in the dunya, but... Little do we know that Allah is giving us even better in the Akhirah. We're going to want, actually, we, we should desire more in the Akhirah than here. That's the second type of response that Allah is giving you something in the Akhirah. So he's not actually ignored you. And the third and final type of response is if Allah does not give you what you want immediately in the dunya or delays it, or if Allah does not substitute it with something better in the Akhirah, then what does Allah do? Allah will at least, at the very minimum, protect you from some type of harm and evil. There was going to be some evil or calamity that was supposed to come your way and Allah diverts that as a result of your dua. So if you were supposed to fall really ill this winter, but you made dua and Allah didn't give you that, maybe Allah will remove that illness. If you were supposed to be involved in some kind of tragic thing, Allah will remove that. Some difficulty, something, Allah removes that, diverts it from you as a result of that dua. But again, we as you know, naive human beings are just going to continue with our life thinking. That, oh, Allah ignored me, Allah didn't give me what I wanted. But Allah knows that he actually diverted something. Allah knows that he's given you something, right? These are the three types of response. So never ever think that Allah has ignored your dua. Never ever think this. Allah is not ignoring you. Allah is not, you know, it's like thinking that Allah is not happy with you, so therefore he has distanced you. Allah hears. He is Samir al basir He hears, he knows, he sees. He is Al-Mujib, he is the one who responds, right? Allah is responding. To everyone, not just Muslim by the way, not Muslim as well, Allah is giving them, if they make dua, Allah will answer their dua as well, no problem. It's not, it's not reserved for, of course, the believer's dua is more powerful, absolutely. It's, the prior, it's top of the priority list. The righteous believers, they're even higher. The prophets, their duas are even higher. It's like, it's like this, you know, this pecking order, right? There's a priority, of course. Allah prioritizes, you know, but He's not going to ignore anyone. Everyone gets it eventually, right? But we just have to aim to be from the elite, from the ones whose du'as are prioritized. And one of the ways that we can make our du'as prioritized is by making the right effective du'a. The effective du'a. And the way that you make an effective du'a, I'm going to leave you with this, inshallah. I'm going to just ignore 
this slide, this is, just leave you with this template, this is the final slide. It's basically a dua template, you can just take a picture of it or something for now, and um, have a look back at it when you get some time. We don't have time to fully go through this right now, but it's a nice little template for dua. How do you begin your dua? How do you end your dua? What can you mention in the dua? Right? And if you follow this template, remember earlier on we asked, you know, how long do you make dua for? One minute, two minutes? Some of you are thinking, how can I make dua for five minutes, six minutes, ten minutes? If you follow this template, honestly, start by praising Allah and His Messenger. This is how you begin your dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma lak alhamd. Like, you know, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Start by praising Allah and then praising the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the etiquette of beginning your dua. Right? And then what do you do? You could mention, for example, things that you're grateful for. Before you ask Allah, just mention, oh Allah, I'm really grateful for this health, family, this opportunity and so on. Because the more you're grateful to Allah and you express gratitude, as Allah says, la azidannakum, la in shakartum, la azidannakum. If you are grateful, I will increase you. So if you want more from Allah, you show and express your gratitude. You mention some of your shortcomings. Do that. Say Allah says, you know, I'm undeserving of your mercy. I'm undeserving of this opportunity. I don't deserve to, to have these things in my life because of oh Allah. I'm a sinner. This is what I struggle with, and so on. You've mentioned your shortcomings. And then you start asking Allah, in, in terms of dunya, what do you want in terms of dunya? In terms of your career, in terms of your relationships, in terms of your... All of these things is dunya related, right? And then you ask akhira related ones. About, you know, the, the akhira, about protection from the hellfire, about jannah. All of these things are akhira related. Already, by the way, just by doing that, a couple of minutes have gone by easily. Now you, now you shouldn't be struggling with making dua for longer than a few minutes because already up until this point, a few minutes have gone by because you've mentioned all of these points. Then you make dua for others, mention your family, mention friends, mention the ummah, right? The people of Palestine, the people of the ummah, mention them as well. Because as we know, uh, in the hadith it's mentioned that if you make dua for your fellow brother or sister in their absence, then the angel comes and says, Ameen, walaka mithluk. I mean, and for you is the same. So if you're making dua, you know, and I always do this, by the way, whenever I'm falling ill, or I've fallen ill, in winter time especially, we fall ill a lot, right? My hack, my cheat code for dua is what? I'm ill and I need Allah to really give me shifa. So what do I do? I make dua for all the people I know who are ill. Oh Allah, this person, my, my niece, my nephew, my husband, they're ill. Oh Allah, grant them shifa. Oh Allah, anyone in the ummah who is ill, grant them shifa. Because I'm hoping the angels are saying, Ameen, and for you, Shifa as well. It's, it's, it's selfish, but you're supposed to be selfish when you make dua. You know this, right? You know, some people, this, mashallah, they're so generous. They spend most of their dua for everyone else, and then they spend a little bit of time for themselves. Listen, if, I, if it was between me and you to get to Jannah first, do you think I'm going to say, Sister, please go ahead, you go to Jannah first? Do you really think I'm going to say that? As nice as you think, you know... Uh, as generous as you think you are If it was between me and my wife Me and my own daughter Do you think I'm going to say to my daughter Yeah, you go to Jannah first Rauda, you go first I'd say, right, get back I'm going first It's Jannah It's Allah it's, You think I'm going to be generous then? So when you're making dua And you're asking Allah Of course, I'm not saying You don't make dua for others I, I, It's here It's here But You know, give yourself more Like each individual is, is responsible for themselves So they need to make dua for themselves more All of us need to make dua for ourselves more Individually You make dua for others as well, great What I'm saying is be a little bit selfish as well Because you need Allah's mercy more than anyone else You need Allah's forgiveness more than anyone else You need Allah's blessings more than anyone else That's the way that we should see it, right? And if you look at the duas of the prophets, the anbiya They always make dua for themselves first You know Musa, uh, Musa alayhi salam He said Rabbi ghfilli wa li akhi he says, oh Allah, forgive me, Musa, Wali Akhi and my brother Harun. Did he mention his brother first? No. Ibrahim Ali Sam says, Rabbana Ighfirli Wali Wali Daya Wali al Mu'minina Yawma Yaqum al This is the dua of Ibrahim Ali Sam. He says, Oh Allah, our Lord, forgive me and Wali Day and my parents, Wali al Mu'minin and the believers, Yawma Yaqum al Hisab. Who did he make dua for first? Did he say dua for his parents first? No. Me and my parents and the believers. He put himself first. All the prophets, they made dua for themselves, then the family, then the believers, etc. So it's, there's nothing wrong with this. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you advice from the Quran, inshallah, right? Mention some of your struggles or complaints, 
mention what you want protection from, mention what you want to do better. And then finally, towards the end of the dua, you ask Allah for acceptance. Because ultimately, what use is that dua if Allah is not accepting? So you say, you know, oh Allah, accept this dua, accept this prayer, accept this supplication. Rabbana taqabbal minna, Allah accept it from us. Except that's how you enter the dua, and then you say ameen. And ameen, for those of you who don't know, the meaning of it is, oh Allah, accept. Ameen means, oh Allah, accept the dua. And then you say ameen, and then this is your dua done. Easily, you have quite a few minutes worth of dua and supplication here. Okay, we end here, inshallah. Unfortunately, we don't have like time for Q and A and things. And apologies if I had to rush this, but please, please utilize your du'as. Do istikhara even for smaller decisions. Make make, make istikhara regular. Make du'a regular and make du'a effective. Make du'a more like a conversation with Allah. Uh, inshallah, you will see the benefits of it. We ask that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grants us what is good in this life and the next. I mean, and Jazakallah khair once again for having me here. And I hope that you all attend the event later on. Uh, 4.30, inshallah. Voices of light. See you there, inshallah. Barakallah feek. Assalamu alaikum.